Right, let's break down some of the favourites, shall we say, when it comes to Euro 2024 on ESPN's Football Forecast. Uh, me and Kweki are going to go through the runners and riders. We're going to talk about the play style of some of these teams, kind of maybe the momentum going into this tournament, which I think is actually crucial, and key players, strengths and weaknesses, and all of that. And actually, we both feel like there's a team that actually, I don't think people are talking about that much, but I think are huge, huge possibilities for going all the way despite having a manager that some people don't fancy anyway <laughs> speaking of which england <laughs> um play style wow um pragmatic i guess at times mm -hmm. um uh, what we have come to really understand as international football and what is needed to kind of do that uh, we're going to talk about france after that and in terms of that sort of mixed tempo that both of them can have at times mm -hmm. they both certainly do that key player who's the key player for you for england mm. England don't win the tournament if Harry Kane doesn't score at least four or five goals. Yeah. Like, I just think it's easy to pick other players, oh, Phil Foden or oh, Jude Bellingham, but really and truly, you need your, your biggest player, your captain, to deliver in the most decisive moments. If Harry Kane scores that penalty against France, I'm not blaming him for it. If he scores that, that goes a different way. He's the yeah. man who's going to be on the penalty spot, taking the penalties, being responsible for scoring goals when games are tight. So Harry Kane's England's most important player for me. Yeah, what about I, you? I think what's interesting with... <laughs> I think Jude Bellingham is a, is a big part of it. I think Declan Rice is incredibly important um, yeah. and how he's used and how he how, how he plays in that role is going to mm -hmm. be really, really important as well. If Gareth Southgate's kind of careful, then he's going to be the six mm -hmm. and he's going he's gonna to have to control games uh, and be able to you know, thread those passes through as well. And, and can, he, can he do that? Yeah. I guess we, we're, we're going to find out. Um, Jude what? Bellingham, Foden, obviously a key yeah. player as well. There's a lot of people talking about, you know, have we got the best player in La Liga, the best player in yeah. uh, the Premier League, the best player in the Bundesliga, yeah. obviously up for debate. I think what's good, again, comparing it to France a little bit, is in terms of our best players, yeah. it's not one guy who's above no. and beyond everyone else. Yeah. Um, it's also a group that has a lot of experience. It's also a group that's generally quite conservative, but understandably one of the the favourites, I think, when it comes to the attacking depth that we've got out wide and through the middle. Mm. The centre-back position may be a bit of a weakness for us or just generally the defence with injuries and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, centre-backs is definitely the, the biggest weakness. And I feel like it's one of these tournaments that if England aren't successful and defence is an issue, we're looking back at the Ben White situation as, uh, as one of the reasons why England didn't yeah. win this tournament. I feel like that's a huge weakness and is the reason why we continue to talk about Harry Maguire starting for England despite the fact that he either has been injured for Manchester United or hasn't played well for Manchester United. Yeah, I think with all of these guys, when I'm looking at the squads, there's squads uh, that I feel like will absolutely have a run amok when it yeah. comes to the groups. Yeah. But then when it gets to quarterfinals, semifinals, final, mm -hmm. you are playing incredible groups of players. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's when I, I get a little bit concerned about a Harry Maguire. I actually think he could be super useful when mm -hmm. it comes to... The, the group stages when you've got teams that might have that bit of size in a, in a Serbia yeah. let's say or you know um, dealing with uh, Hoyland uh, that could be another one yeah. because he'll know him from training he'll, and he likes to sort of have a little battle Harry Maguire might enjoy that set pieces yeah. down the other end as well but when it gets to sort of the Frances the, the Spains the Portugals the clever Germany, those kind of teams, that's where I would get a little bit concerned. Well, that's, and that's an issue as well because people always make the argument Harry Maguire's never let, let England down I watched the England-France game at the World Cup and he was not at his best. He struggled massively with the threats that France posed. And it wasn't just the physicality of Olivier Giroud, but it was Anson Griezmann just running the game, pulling players into areas that they don't want to be in. And that's where England were going to have an issue. But ultimately, we'll get through the group and we'll see how things land and we'll see who we avoid or who we play. And I think yeah. that will determine who wins this tournament as well. Totally agree. Uh, let's stay with France. We talk about the different players. Okay, you know, in terms of a market value, Mbappe is on a different planet. In yeah. terms of being crucial to to their international side, I think Griezmann is right there alongside him. I think yeah. no one is as, as um, frightening as Mbappe um, when it comes to international football, in my opinion. But yeah. Griezmann in a very different style, along with Giroud as well. Yeah. You know what you're getting with France, really. And I think the big thing in comparison from England to France is that depth at the back. Yeah. And their defence is it's a, a joke. joke. It's an absolute joke. And it's, and yeah, the amount of centre-backs that they've got, that's the amount of centre-backs that won't even play, the amount of centre-backs that didn't even get called up, it's, it's crazy. And obviously they've got the attacking talents. And for me, 
key player. Obviously, he's killing Mbappe, but Anton Griezmann, when it comes to major tournaments, is a sight to behold. And anybody who just doesn't pay attention to Anton Griezmann when France are playing because your eyes are fixed on Mbappe, yeah, yeah. just watch what this man does. Totally. It, it, everything goes through him. He kind of... He's allowed to play. He's allowed to beat Anton Griezmann. And we've seen him do it for his France out wide in his, when he was younger. And more recently, we've seen him do it in the more central position where he just drops into midfield and he just dictates tempo. He's, he's quick on the turn. It's almost like when Iniesta was at his best for Spain. It was just like he could do everything. If it's, yeah. if it's playing as a false nine or playing that wide or playing deeper. And so I think he's crucial to what France do. And when you've got that solid foundation in terms of defence, there's no reason why beyond England, France are the favourites to win this tournament. Yeah, I agree with you. I think actually... In terms of out-and-out out squads, there's maybe one squad that's pushing them, which we're going to get to. Giroud up front, 37, but you know what you're going to get. It's going to be that backboard, bring other players into play. And at international level, it's a very useful tool when you're trying to give Mbappe that little bit of space and Griezmann that little bit of space as well. Yeah. You know, incredible midfielders, incredible defenders. Wow. Germany. Home nation. Yeah. So, uh, new manager in Nagelsmann. Hansi Flick obviously failed uh, pretty miserably. Mm -hmm. um, Nagelsmann has tested a few different systems out. And yeah. it, it feels like, just in time, in the last international break, he's made that change. He wanted to play 4-2-2-2. It wasn't working. He's Good gone choice. to a 4 2 3 one, And I think that is giving people a little bit more more hope, isn't it, when it comes to change? 100%, because the narrative's qu quickly shifted with Nagelsmann. Um, before the previous international break, they lost their last two games against Turkey, 3-2, against Austria, 2-0, and everyone's thinking the sky's falling. Everyone's thinking, after this tournament, Nagelsmann's done. Then that next international break comes, they beat France convincingly 2-0, and everyone's like, ooh, they're about now, and then they beat Netherlands 2-1. It's like, okay, two of the biggest nations, and you beat them in the two final games before the end of the season. Yeah. I think they're in a good shape before this tournament. It's just about whether the pressure of being the home nation at a tournament like this gets to them. The Germans, we know, apart from the previous couple of tournaments, we know how efficient they are when it comes to major tournaments. But this variation of Germany have got maybe more... They're more expansive. They've got players who maybe get you off your seat a little bit more, especially with the emergence of some of the teams or some of the German teams in the European competitions, competitions this year. They've got yeah. some players that maybe wouldn't have thought about a year or two ago. So I do really like the shape of this Germany team. I just think that it's going to be difficult. And the group is sneaky difficult. Mm. Scotland in the opening game is not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. And that's one of those games that they're looking not to lose because like Scotland could... I think Scotland is very good. Straight. Good straight. Good straight. Yeah, I think lacking a little bit of pace... Um, I would yeah. have a question to anyone who's German who's, or who's lived in Germany. I have heard a few things about how in terms, a lot of Germans don't actually really enjoy the national team. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments down below if that is uh, a right thing to say. Obviously, that's not a blanket statement. Obviously, there's a lot of people that'd be up for it uh, for Germany. But in terms of that energy within the country, yeah. um, they'll be hoping that they'll all feel like home games. And I'm sure, sure overall they will. The new setup, 4-2-3-1, you've got Cruz coming back, mm. you've got Wurtz, Musiala in the same team. I think that's crucial for them. But as I say, just lacking that little bit of pace, Kai Havertz will play up top, will he, or possibly full crook. Full but crook, if you play maybe. Havertz, yeah. is he going to work the channels or how are you going to play it? I think with Tony Cruz in the team, Tony Cruz has been so amazing for Real Madrid this year, but he has runners. Yeah. And I think actually the way that Germany will play is they'll yeah. sort of walk their way yeah. up the pitch then try and thread those balls through to Wurtz and to Musiala and then from there something can be created. But think about players in names Wurtz, Musiala, Kai Havertz and you think about the incredible centre midfielders Gundogan, Tony Cruz it's a very narrow team and then even their full bats Joshua Kimmich, Kimmich steps yeah. in so like it's there's no width there mm. so not only have they got like a lack of pace it's lack of anybody who wants to stay out wide and run in behind so that's why I think their troubles will, will come especially because a lot of these teams, if you look at them, a lot of the top teams, they haven't got amazing fullbacks. So if you've got great wingers, you can really have some joy at this mm. tournament. That's why I think England will have some joy. Um, but I think this German team is just a little bit too narrow and that's going to be their, their biggest issue in this that's tournament. Interesting. Portugal, here we go. <laughs> Come on, eh? yeah. So me and Kweku, we're yeah. feeling Portugal. Yeah. We are feeling Portugal. Of course, Fernando Santos, uh, we wave goodbye to him. Of course, one Euro to 2016. Uh, was Ronaldo's guy. R was essentially Ronaldo's assistant manager at different times. Um, <laughs> now Roberto Martinez has come in. Mm -hmm. A manager that I think in this country gets somewhat disrespected. Yep. Um, at Belgium, uh, he, he did fine. I think it was the golden generation. Mm -hmm. From a lot of reports, it feels like there was a lot at play mm -hmm. with that group of people. Yeah. And they d didn't possibly enjoy each other's company that much. And we saw that in... In the World Cup, uh, they were very poor when it came to that. But he's now gone to Portugal. 
And this squad... It's a joke. It's <laughs> honestly, it's, it's, it's a joke. Wild. It's wild. It's so a joke. deep. And it's crazy that they're not the favourites. And I understand it because you need to see this team do it at a major tournament. And they, they had a meltdown in the World Cup, yeah. courtesy of Cristiano Ronaldo. He's their biggest issue still to this day because they've got so many good players. And of course, he scored loads of goals in Saudi Arabia and he's still Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. But I feel like this Portugal team is more progressive about him in it. I don't think they need it. I don't think they need a centre forward. I think they can play. And a lot of, of course, a lot of teams are now reverting to those big, burly strikers because of the Erlen Haaland era that we live in right now. I think this Portugal team got enough attack and talent to play with a false nine and to still be as effective about Cristiano Ronaldo in their side. The two strikers, it's Ramos and it's Ronaldo. Um, What I really like about this group is that you've got the the general baseline of the squad is so high. But then also, you've... Martinez has figured out a way for them to play yeah. that, that works so much better and, and gets away from some of the problems, mm-hmm. which include Fernandez, who's been absolutely phenomenal in qualifying. I think 13 goal involvements in qualifying. Yeah. But when you look at the, the teams and their heat maps and their average positions, he's staying away from Ronaldo. Yeah. I remember saying, and I got a lot of heat for it, but he actually ended up um, getting dropped in the second game, Bruno Fernandez, because him, uh, Bernardo Silva, and Ronaldo, they all kept getting kind of bunched together. Yeah. They need to stay away from each other because you want Bruno Fernandes to have that space to play those key passes. He can do that. Yeah. Ronaldo, I think, is now they've clicked from that point of view. They have a single pivot in Polina, and mm-hmm. then the two centre backs spread out wide, and you've got Cancelo who then steps in as an inverted fullback. Yeah. So the balance of the team got Rafael Leao on that left hand side if you want to use him as well. Ruben Neves on the bench. You've yeah. got Antonio Silva, who's such an exciting player at centre back for them. Ruben Diaz. The Jeff, goalkeepers Jeff are Felix. amazing as just, well. It, it, it's just an embarrassment of riches. They're yeah. so, so good. But there's a, it feels like there's a balance to them that yeah. I think sometimes with other teams, you're not totally sure if they've got that balance. Yeah, no. I'm, and and that excites me. No, it's so exciting. There's, there's so many different ways to skin a cat as well. And that's why I think this Portugal team have got. If you decide to, you can bring Liao off the bench and stretch your position. You can kind of go a bit more compact. You can play that boxer midfield that Man City have. They they can do absolutely everything. And that's why, for me, they're not necessarily dark horses because they're one of the favourites. But there's, people should be talking more about the Portugal side, for yeah. sure. And an easy group as well, <laughs> I've got to be honest. Well, a, a group that they should be comfortably winning, yeah. especially with the talent that they've got. Sadly, the defending champions are not England. It was Italy who won that penalty shootout. And they come into this tournament a very different team with yeah. a different manager. How are you feeling about Italy? Well, my refer- reference point for Italy is their game against England in December when they lost 3-1. Yeah wasn't very impressed and with Italy it's it's difficult because last tournament before going into it last Euros wasn't very impressed by them they end up winning it with Emerson's one of their fullbacks Jorginho's one of their key players and it's an Italy team that if they can come together they can make some noise but if you look at the players this Italy team we've got at their disposal I like Skamaka I think he's had a great season at Atalanta but I don't know if he's necessarily a player that's going to spearhead the team to win in a tournament I think they're going to have a very very difficult tournament this Italy side yeah I totally agree I, I think Again, the last international break was really beneficial for them. I want to say they played Venezuela and Colombia. And in that, Spalletti, who likes 4-3-3 and had played 4-3-3 in that uh, game against England, amongst others, he gave up on it. Yeah. He looked at the squad and he thought, look, we've got players like Bastoni in here. We've got teams that gen- players who generally play in teams that play with a back three. He went to that back three. It looked much better. Yes. Um, different kind of opposition. But what that leads to, in my opinion, when I look at it, is is a midfield where you've got Barella and Jorginho quite possibly. And Barella is someone who kind of wants to leave that, yeah. that middle. So I wonder if Jorginho could get in trouble in transition. Of course, you'd have a back three behind that. Yeah. Um, and then up front, I think with Skamaka, does he play 90 minutes? Like how often yeah. he gets taken off. Um, can he, you know, say Giroud, a similar style of player maybe. He's got other players around him. I don't feel like, yes, you've got Chiesa, who's one of the few match winners in this team. I don't have a great feeling about them. I've got to be honest. I don't, and it's a, it's a difficult group. Um, Croatia, Spain. Mm. I, I think Albania will probably end up bottom yeah. of that group, but I think it's a difficult group for Italy, and they could end up not getting out of that group, which is which is a great. So it's, it's a possibility. And I just I don't know. With Italy side, they're just not the names. I remember I was going through. I was, I was talking to Roy Jennings about it. Going through Italy tides of the past, where they just got at least four or five names that you recognise, and this Italy side have not got that player that you think if they're in trouble can drag them through it. And as a result of that, I think they're going to have an underwhelming tournament. And lastly, Spain. 
Uh, who again one where I think people overall will look at their squad and feel like it's maybe a bit disjointed maybe it's a little bit green in certain places yeah. um, but I think what you can expect with Spain is yeah. that they will own the football they will own the football the problem for me with Spain is burnout and I, it always seems like it's not always recently seen the case I don't think Pedri's been the same since for the last couple of years mm. um, you think about Lamina Mal as a 16 year old how much football he's played for Barcelona this season you think about how much football Rodri's played as well who he is their key player that he's, yeah. their, he's their best player I think the Spain side I think the, their weakness is potentially burn out in terms of the amount of football that these, um, their players have played um, but they will keep the ball they will retain possession and that will allow the players to rest in parts and you expect them to get through their group as well yeah a tricky group again with some teams that you, you thought were great not sure just how great they are now yeah I think that 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 mix between a couple of really high quality players and people with such potential Pau Cabasi 17 year old yeah. centre back Lamine Yamal as you've said Nico Williams Fermin Lopez Pedri, who and uh, we forget how kind of young he is as mm -hmm. well. Um, yeah, I think it's one where I expect them to go far, but I'm not sure yeah. they can get the, get the whole way there. I yeah. think that's the one. Morata as well, I think, has had a really, really strong season. So, although he comes under a lot of um, stick a lot of times. Well, he's the captain now. Or yeah, is yeah he's I think he could get himself some uh, goals in this tournament as well. Mm. Um, so, lots of quality teams there, but which one is going to win it? Let us know in the comments down below. Throughout Euro 2024, Bet365 is unleashing their super boost every single match day. So make sure you check out their boost to find out that it's never ordinary at Bet365.